Uh, before we begin, I want to acknowledge the presence of, uh, of Julie Berman, Robert Julius Berman, who, uh, former president of the OU, and who many of the, the over the last uh, several decades, about 30 something years, there's been enormous growth in, in terms of the, 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 um, you know, the, out, the, the, the extent of where the OU cautious, where it's writ run, so to speak. And a lot of it is, um, is to Julie's credit. He was one of our Salvatrix Prize, Talmudim, very close to the Rav. Many of the other projects, including the o OU Press, Julie has his imprint on it. So, uh, you know, deserves a big yeshikoyach. Um, just in terms of just, we're going to first give a little bit of an outline about the OU in terms of how we run this operation. It, the OU has grown over the last several years enormously by a factor of 20 um, or more. Um, and um, one of the reasons for the enormous growth is, aside for instance, wide leadership, is because of the, the change in the world economy. And that is, now we live in a global economy, um, and ingredients come from all, from the most distant places on the globe. We have, you know, one of the ingredients that we use is sodium caseinate, which is a milk protein. So it's derived from milk, and to get it efficiently, you have to obviously go to farms that have the milk, you know, where you get milk from cows, and companies are looking further and further to find it. They went afterwards when the Soviet Union col collapsed, they were going to Eastern Europe um, because they had these, you know, the communist system, very large centralized um, uh, herds. And then as, the, as the, both either pieces of supply or price, they kept moving further. And we sent a person from Israel, Marty Grunberg, who went to Tibet, the roof of the world, to see the, the milking of yak for, for, this, for this purpose. Why did we go there? It's not that we're interested in being in China or Tibet or, or these most obscure places in the globe. It's because in the global economy, American companies are looking to the, literally to the edge of the, of, the, of the world to bring in ingredients. And we have to be there to, to, to supervise it. And we've created large systems in terms of our program, our, um, computer programs to analyze this. We have about 9,000 plants now under the OU in over 80 countries. We have a million ingredients in our database that have to be evaluated all the time. And then, of course, there are shilas that come up in halacha um, that, we, that, we, that we deal with. And uh, so that's all part of the mix. When I came to the OU, there was one and a half people in the conscious department. Um, um, my predecessor was Rabbi Lifshitz and uh, Rabbi Reese, who was a part-timer. Now we have something, uh, um, something between 15 and 60 rabbis just in our office um, with a lot of staff and so on handling all of these diff different issues. So you see, both in terms of the the and the how it's, how, it's, how it's grown. I'm going to deal with just one question that comes up all the time. Then I'm going to ask Robert Elephant to speak about some of these things as well. One issue that we, we hear about all the time, there are two issues that we have to confront. One is Bishal Akum, which uh, you mentioned yourself. You know, what systems do we have? And this is a locha that's often in people's homes, at least where I live, is, you know, observed in the breach. Um, and the, the halacha is that food that, in order, that was cooked, the, the Chazal made this kzeh, it's a mishnah, and a vodazor, a mishnah, to avoid, at least to avoid, um, as a bulwark against intermarriage, that, that the food that is of a high grade, which is ola shulchem alochem, literally means that can be served at a king's table, whether that's actually the standard or not, and also food that has to, that um, can't be eaten raw, or is not generally eaten raw, requires that it should be, there has to be some Jewish participation in the cooking. So I'm just going to deal with one issue which comes up. What is, what's the definition of Ola Shulcham Alachim? That's a very ambiguous phrase. Ola Shulcham Alachim can mean one of two things. It could mean, it can be interpreted to mean literally something that's served at a king's table. So it means an extraordinarily high, you know, very high grade. Or that would mean something in our contemporary context, something, you know, it's served at a chasna. But junk food, for example, would be excluded. Potato chips and things like that. Or Ola Shulchem Lachem mean that it's not an inferior grade, it's something that, you know, you wouldn't even be embarrassed to eat or to serve, 
and, and then potato chips would be included in, in that issue. So Rav Schwab, I once had a discussion with Rav Schwab about this, and he thought that Allah showed, he said that he once heard, he asked the Chazanish about this, and the Chazanish said that he thought Allah Shoch Malacha means literally served, it means not what literally served at, at uh, a, a king's table, but something that, that even a king could eat. Because the, the issue that Rabbi Shua was dealing with, asked the Chazanish about, is whether you can eat sardines. Because um, the joint used to send out cans of sardines, and the Chazanish said, no, it's us, it's us, it's Bishalakum. So the Chazanish said, but many Doilim thought it was Mutter, including Rabbi Chaim Oiza. So the Chazanish said, say, Haltan's Mutti, Haltan's also. Obviously, a difference of opinion about this. So he asked them, but what does it mean, Ola Shulchem Elohim? So the Chazni says, as the Kenik for England, the King of England, for Fristag, for breakfast, as sardines, he also eats sardines. So there are different opinions, and these are the kind of issues that we deal with all the time. So I just want to tell you the OU's position is, and this is uh, after, with, after consultation with the Rav, with Rav Salvechik, he thought it was a more lenient position, was, was the correct one. It meant that it was, Ola Shochem Locha Kipshutu, as it sounds, means something that is served um, you know, at a king's table, means something that's a high grade, but something that is potato chips, or not a high grade, would not be included in the East of Bishalakim. Having said that, we set up systems in factories, um, sometimes computerized, to make sure that the Jew lights the fire, the mashkiach lights the fire, or the, um, and if it's set up for, for Beis Yosef, we set it up also on occasion, which we did for tuna fish, at the request of Mordechai Yahu, who was then the Svadi chief rabbi of Israel, to make sure that, that that actually there the mashkiach is not just lighting the fire, which is the leniency of the Ramor, which is good for Ashkenazi, but we set up a system also for, um, for Svadim that would be acceptable to them as well. These are the kind of things that we deal with and we, what, that we juggle to try to make it that it's something that is un a high standard, universally accepted. For, I just want to give you one other example, then I want to introduce Rabbi Elephant. Um, one other example is in terms of Chol of Yisrael. Um, you know that there's a very big dispute about what the definition of Chol Yisrael is. The pre but there's a lot of misinformation about this. The pre was of the opinion that our milk now in America, he doesn't speak about America, he, you know, he was here before America, but the pre says that if, that it's not there was a specific Isa. There was a chashash, a concern that maybe the milk that, that came into the, into the milk stream was, came from a non-kosher animal whether they milk pigs or trephus or whatever, um, and that milk would be forbidden. So therefore, Chazal said that you should, you should always have Yisrael Eyu, a Jew, a mashkiach, who knows what the source is to make sure it's cold. But it's not that the milk per se, that they made exayr that it's also. It was a chashash. That's the opinion of the pri -chodesh. The chasam soifer was machmir, and the chasam soifer said, based on a reading of a, of a Rashi, which the Chazanish thought was not correct, but the Chazam Soifis, no, they made a gzera, that all, even if there's no chashash, that if not Yisrael Re'el, all the milk is osa. So there are those who are machmir for this Chazam Soifer, those who are maker like the Prichadosh. It's interesting to know, this is not generally known, but Chazan Ish in his chuvis held like the Prichadosh. Lineage, so therefore, the, all the milk in America, without the Moshe Feinstein's chuva, according to the Chazan Ish, is permitted. Um, I once spoke to the type to uh, Rav Chaim Kinyevsky's son about it, Rav Shlomo Kinyevsky, and he said that's, I said that, that that's of course that's what he said. And in his chuvis, he interestingly says that Rav Vazna, Zechon Levracha, once when he, he the Chaznis was consulting with him, and Rav Vazna said, I don't think you should print this chuva. So uh, because you know the Chazam Soif in this, and, and, the, and Rav Vazna writes all of this in the Shev of the Levi, he says, but the Chaznis said, no, I'm going to print this chuva, and he did print it, and he thought it was mutter. So. Um, but Rav Moshe finds out even a more elaborate heter, namely that even according to the Chassam Soifer, Rav Moshe thought nowadays, since there's government inspection in the United States and regulation, all of that is the equivalent, even according to the Chassam Soifer of Yisrova Eyu. I mention this because there are disputes, but how does the OU take care of this? So we, when anything is made on dairy equipment, we will always designate it as OUD, sometimes DE, de dairy equipment, because even according to, to uh, if you didn't hold like the Chassam Soifer, many of these things would be permitted because we consider all the milk to be permitted and it would be maybe a not by not, it would, wouldn't be a problem. Um, and it would be, but since we're concerned about, about those who are mocked about Chal of Yisrael, like the Chassam Soifer, we always will designate to let people know 
if it's, you know, that, that even though the standard is not Chol Vesol, but if it's not, so everybody could use it, if there's a dairy component or, or something, even that would be, that would normally, according to the, the, the lenient opinion of the Pichadish would be Mutter, we always make sure to designate it on our labels. Rabbi Elfin, you want to? Thank you, Rabbi Ganak. Um, it's a little hard to speak about Rabbi Ganak in his present mix of Shvach I when I when I think about Rabbi Ganak, you know, we work very very closely together. Not just the many hours we're in the office together, but many hours when we're not in the office together, we've traveled around the world together. You know, what, but the one thing I I'd like to point out, and this really helps define what our OU Kashus department is really all about. There's a lot of talk, a lot of talk, especially lately, about the United Nations. And certainly that the United Nations does not represent a place that is friends of our people. But when I think of the United Nations, I don't think of the UN, because who would want to think about them? I think about the OU Kashus department. A and it's a Kiddush Hashem to walk in to the OU Kashrus department. What Rabbi Ganak has been able to accomplish is that, as he said, we have between 50 and 60 Rabbonim. I'm not speaking about the literally hundreds and hundreds of Mashgichim and Shoichtim and Baitkim around the country and around the world that work for us. But just this, our office where we have between 50 and 60 Rabbonim. And all of these Rabbonim come from all the yeshivas that we all are so familiar with. Yitzchak Chanan and Lakewood and Tarvadan, Samir and Chaim Berlin and every yeshiva. There's only one, there are only two requirements Rabbi Ganak asks of us is that we be Talmidei Chachamim, really three Talmidei Chachamim, Yirei Shemayim, and Bali Midais. And that's really what we've been able to put together, he's been able to put together, and that's why I believe we, Baruch Hashem, been so very, very successful in, set, in certifying hundreds and thousands of products all around the country and around, around the world. I, I want to speak just about a number of points quickly, because these are questions that are very often asked and also represent misconceptions. Rabbi Ganak mentioned that Mr. Berman um, is here, and I still remember when I was interviewed for my position during a Sarasimay Shuvah in 1987 by Rabbi Ganak, and Hoshana Rabba of 1987 by Mr. Berman in his office. And after I joined the OU, the world of Kashris, I'm talking on the marketing side, was changing. <clears throat> and there was an emerging of what is known as Chassidish Ashgachis. Many, the, the Chassidish community, the Hamish community was growing, and they wanted to buy product with their supervision certification on it. At that time, the OU had a policy in place that the OU did not certify dual supervisions. There were some minor exceptions. But if you wanted to be OU certified, you could not be certified by anyone else at the same time. But the OU, which is a perfect, the OU cashless department, which is a perfect blend of the Rabbonim and the Balabatim working together, recognized the change in the market and recognized that that was a market that could not be ignored. That was a growing and continues to be a growing market. And how are we going to service them? So under some very strict conditions that we keep until this very day, and I can mention them briefly, we will only do dual supervision with a chesidish ashgacha that is a reliable chesidish ashgacha. But most importantly to the conversation that I'd like to have today is we will not be a haskama. The OU is not a rubber stamp. The OU does not represent what we know that this Hashgacha does a good job and is very choshverov and has very fine mashgichim, and therefore they, they're entitled to put on the OU symbol. That doesn't happen. And therefore any product that you see the OU on, whether it's a wine, whether it's a meat, or it's a candy, or any other product that has both the OU and another supervision on it, the OU is involved in the supervision. Just this afternoon, we received emails about one of our Rabbonim, his name is Rabbi Miller, lives in Muncie, 
just spent the week last week in Uruguay, in South America, inspecting shritas. Now these shritas have also chesidish ashgacha, but that doesn't mean that we didn't send our own representative to do our own supervision. And so is the case in wine, which also very commonly has another ashgacha, but that doesn't prevent us, and not only doesn't prevent us, we very much require our own representation in supervising these establishments. The second point, issue I'd like to raise, um, I, I know it was part of the agenda, so we'll speak about it briefly. And that is kashrus in America versus kashrus in Israel. When I speak about kashrus in America versus kashrus in Israel, I, I really have two areas to discuss. One is, again, what and who is the OU in Eretz Yisrael? So again, it's important to point out that the OU in Eretz Yisrael, where we certify, Rabbi Ganak just told me the other day, he, he, he got the exact number, that we certify 200 plants in Israel, again, is not a Haskama. Most of the facilities that we certify in Israel, the vast majority are supervised by the Bedat State Achredis, many are also certified by Rabbi Rubin. But that doesn't mean that we don't have our own staff in Israel, we have an office in Israel, and we do our own inspections, albeit maybe not as often as we would be, sort of, as we would be visiting a place that has no other hashgacha. There's no reason why we need to duplicate effort. You know, I always say, many years ago, there was a small spice factory all the way up in the north of Israel, in Akko. It's not even open anymore. It was a small spice factory that had 35 employees all together, and they had nine hashgachas. They didn't have just nine hashgachas. They had nine mashgichim. So you could understand, you have a small factory with nine mashgichim, it's going to be a recipe for a lot of friction. And that's exactly what happened. But now they had a problem. All these mashgichim couldn't get along. And there was nobody in Israel who could make peace between all nine of them, because everybody in Israel was, was assigned to a certain group. So everybody was Nogei Bedover. So they asked me, because the OU doesn't get involved in this petty politic, to come to Israel to try to settle this machlaikis. And I went, and the OU was Baruch Hashem helpful in settling the issue there. The point I make is that we, even though there are so many hashgachas and so many factories in Israel, we still remain independently involved in all of those facilities. But number two, the question that's always asked, and I don't know if we're going to go into the details, but one of the differences, I would say the stark difference between the OU and our position here in the United States and around the world versus the Rabbanut in Israel, you know, the, the most commonly asked question is because Baruch Hashem, everybody's traveling to Israel. Where can I eat? What can I eat? It's a very hard question to ask, and we're not going to answer it. But what is the difference between the OU versus the Rabbanut? The OU is certainly not a private business, a communal organization, as you've certainly noticed today. But the OU doesn't have to give any hashgacha it doesn't want to give. And therefore, we're very serious about our standards. We're very serious about how we give Ashgacha. And every company that we certify has to sign a contract. And every company that we certify has to agree to unannounced visits by our Mashgichim. And every company we certify has to agree to only use the ingredients that we tell them with the stipulations that we tell them to follow. And therefore, if the company says, well, rabbis, this is not for us, so we say, then it's not for us. It's not a shidduch. In Israel, it's much more complicated because the rabbanut is really part of the government. And every company is really entitled to a hashgacha. And it becomes much more complicated for them to decline giving hashgacha much more than we, we don't ever have a problem declining hashgacha. I really have to say, and I see Mr. Savitsky standing here as well, a former president of the OU, a former, he was also a president and chairman of Kashrus, but to the credit of the OU Balabatim, in the close to 30 years that I'm at the OU, I don't recall one situation where OU Balabatim told us, the Rabbonim, you have to give this hashgacha. 
I actually remember cases where we wanted to give the hashgacha and they said no. So we, we, we're not obligated to do any hashgacha. They have a much greater challenge, and that's why it needs much greater care and precision when visiting Israel. The last point I want to make, and it's a point that I often make when I have the opportunity to speak to audiences. I know the attitude, and it's an understandable attitude, of people who come to a session, people who are interested in knowing about kashras, people who care about kashras, as well, that's your job. It's the job of the Rabbonim to give good kashras, and therefore we'll be comfortable at home to eat the product that, we, um, that you certify. And I have to respectfully tell you that that isn't the way we look at it. The way we look at it very much is that you, not just Rabbonim, and not just the Balabatim of the OU, but you, the consumers of kosher food, have a lot to say about kashras. Certainly on the simple level, if you see a food that you want certified, then you should tell the company you want it certified. I always repeat the story that for many years, the o Mars Food, one of the largest, if not the largest candy company in the United States, did not, was not interested in kosher certification. They finally were interested in the OU supervision for one reason, because there were ice cream companies that were OU certified that used to use that used to use M&M &M bits for They used to use M&M &M bits for their ice cream. And they said, well, they need to be certified because the ice cream is certified, our factory is certified. Not long after M&M &M became certified, they came back to the OU, the Mars company, and they said, we want anything that's certifiable to be kosher, to be OU. And we asked them, what happened? You never were interested in us. They said, you know, in the back of every pack of food that we package, there's an 800 number, consumer number. And we got a lot of calls after the M&Ms became certified. And the words, I'll never forget the words they used. They said, those calls were passionate. People were very excited that we became kosher. And that's why we decided we'll go all the way with the OU. So you have a lot to say about what will become certified. But it's not only what, it's also standard. You know, we can only do as much as we can do, and we try very hard. But the example, you know, all of us, or many of us may recall that a number of years ago, there was a situation, a terrible tragedy in Muncie, where there was a butcher shop owned by a religious Jew under a supervision that was caught selling non-kosher meat and poultry. Baruch Hashem wasn't OU certified. It's terrible that it was certified. And what, in our opinion, was the problem? And the problem was one problem. The problem was that there was no mashgiach there on a full-time basis because they relied on the owner who was a from Jew, a Talmud Chacham. And we, for example, at the OU, when we certify a restaurant or anywhere, any restaurant, dairy or fleshics, and certainly any meat establishment, have full-time supervision. So it's the consumer, if you walk in and you don't see a mashgiach, then walk out. And we've invested tremendous resources and continue to do so in making sure that we educate the community about kashras, this session being a perfect example. But we're open to calls. We get calls all the time. We have one Rav who's just devoted to answering consumer questions. It's a difficult job answering 300 times a week if Oreo cookies are milichigs or parav. <laughs> We're still not sure if it's not the, the same person calling all 300 times. <laughs> but it's, we are very anxious to work with you. I just want to conclude, I just want to conclude with a story that I just saw. And if I just saw it, it must be I should share it. There, you know, this situation, it's not new, of children at risk, children not succeeding. And when Rekiva Eger, was the rob of the town of Poznan. He was approached by parents that had a child who as a young boy was very successful, doing very well in yeshiva. 
And then as he was growing up, he, he wasn't the same. And they took him to doctors, and they took him to all sorts of analysis. Nobody could pinpoint what happened. They came to Ricky Vega. And Ricky Vega said, is it possible that he ate non-kosher food? His parents said, non-kosher food? In our home? It's not possible. Ricky Vega said, make sure. And they started remembering that there was a butcher in town who had not followed the directions of the Rav. And the Rav removed, Rabbi Kivega <coughs> removed the Hashgacha. It was still kosher, but he removed the Hashgacha. And then there was somebody making a party, a simcha, and this butcher without Hashgacha, obviously his meat, poultry, was cheaper <coughs> than the butcher who did have Hashgacha. This Baal Simcha used that meat instead of the other meat. And this child ate from that butcher. Rabbi Kivega said, that's your problem. Machalos Asuris, kosher food, has a profound effect on who we are and who our children are. And together, we can hopefully work together to have Doris Yishar Muvarachim. This is a question and answer session. So. Yeah. I'm going to ask, when traveling on planes, not a lot, but regular planes, are there things that we need to be concerned about from a kosher perspective for having a cup of tea and, and things like that? Or is that right. not a concern? Um, the yeah, the question is, what's... The, how careful does a person have to be, I'm just rephrasing it, you know, while flying on an on a airline in terms of food, food that's given to them? So in terms of the coffee or tea, um, it, it, this is, I'm just making it a broader issue, not just in terms of airlines. You know, there's a, the Starbucks, which happens to be under the OU, now um, 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 the, the Chicago Rabbinical Council put out a, a, a suggestion that people should be careful about buying Starbucks in its current stores, even though the coffee is fine, because Starbucks in most stores now has begun to, to, up, to increase its, its offerings, and it also has now sandwiches, which are not kosher. They wash them all together, and, you know, that was their suggestion. L'chadchila, it's a good suggestion, but the is probably mutter, because all what you know, what you what you would be offered at the end would probably be something that would be bottled. In terms of airlines, similarly, I mean, first of all, if assuming that they're giving it to you in a paper cup and everything is throwaway, the likelihood is that it's okay. They have standards in the you know the coffee bins that they have, so those I think are, uh, are okay. The, the 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 general problem in terms of what they offer on the plane, you know, so that you look at the thing, the OU or whatever, you know, supervision that's reliable. Very good. I recently was in a grocery store and I bought a bottle of Arizona drink, OU on the back. It was called Blueberry Green Tea Diet. I was horrified later. It was tasted pretty good. I was horrified looking at the ingredients to discover there's not one drop of any kind of blueberry in the ingredients. Everything's artificial, whatever. But there was a picture of beautiful blueberries on the label. I think that's Gnevis Das. Why does the OU allow such a thing? Because I wrote them a letter. And what did they respond? They said that the, the higher up, up, up people are looking into this. Looking into this. Right. Okay. So, you know, in, I don't know. I don't think that, frankly, I mean, if you if you written the letter to me, I, I don't think that's per se Geneva Stas. That's called marketing. But I mean, but marketing <laughs> um, is maybe as, as positive on Geneva Stas. But just in terms, but I think it's a good thing to, to focus on. You know, when you buy a product, especially flavors, flavors are something that are enormously halachically, halachically sensitive because it's a vital timer and they're not bottled. We have a special section. Uh, uh, two people actually who deal with flavors, Rabbi Zwick in my office and also Rabbi Neuberger, because there are components to flavors that are, that you know, you wouldn't expect that can have an impact on the, on the flavor, like civet, which comes from the civet cat, or castorium that comes from beavers, or oil of cognac. So flavors, you know, companies create these, 
delicious things with different flavors. I think people know in general, you know, what it means. They don't think they're putting actually blueberries per se. Blueberries may be a component that they extract from blueberries. I'm just giving in terms of your example. I don't know the specific, but it's not blueberries that they're squeezing, you know, in their backyard and putting in. So, it, I. I I, I think you're, you know, the world you're living in, Robert Goodman, is a little naive to think that that's what they were doing. But I, I don't know if that's really Gnevis Das. I just want to say one other thing, but more generally in terms of what the OU's responsibility is. We did calls, this is just a corollary of your question. You know, how do you give supervision to this? It has so much sugar, it has sodium, it's not healthy in this. We're not experts in that area. We're just giving in terms of what the product is kosher. Now. All those other in issues, including with, you know, marketing issues or Gnevis Das issues and so on, the, the, we really rely on the, on the government agencies that, that, that have the expertise to, to evaluate these kind of things into the healthfulness of products and so on. We usually, this is the first time I actually got this kind of good, but the, the issue about healthfulness of, you know, how do you give supervision to this product that it has its junk and has this and that? It may be true, it may not be true. You know, I'm not, again, we're not in position to evaluate that, and we don't make an evaluation about it. The OU only tells you that in terms of the CASTRA standard that, and the implementation that, that we, we stand behind that. Well, actually, on some of the soy meals, we, we've started to do it, you know. Um, but the question is, uh, yeah, the question is, why don't we have more use of the DE? And the truth is, we've been very reluctant to do it because for two reasons. But, but we're, our position is beginning to change now. And I'll tell you how it's changing. The, the reluctance was, you know, the more symbols that we put on that are confusing to people. So, no, DE, we have to remember, the OU is sold throughout the 50 states and, you know, in many, many countries throughout the world. And it, for the more the symbols that we put on, sometimes it can get very confusing for the average consumer. Now, the DE is important for a person who wants to eat it after, you know, it's a not by not, so you can have it within, within you know, a, immediately after, not immediately, but after eating flesh. And there's a value to that. But, but it's confusing to a lot of companies. And as Rabbi Elephant mentioned before, the most air shyler in the United States nowadays is about Oreo cookies. Is it par or not? And the, answer, and the answer is that the standard Oreo, the standard Oreos are at this point par. That, that could change. But it still says O-U-D. But, and, but there are those, you know, some of the per combination permutations of the, some of the Oreos are not necessary. But the standard Oreo that you get, we, we still t tell, you know, when people call the office, it's PAV, even though it has OUD. But it's interesting. Why, do we, why does it still have an OUD? Because the company, Nabisco, that produces Oreos, doesn't want, want, insists that it say OUD. Because if it changes its formulation, it doesn't want to have to throw out its millions of dollars that it has in inventory and labels. So they will not change it. But we've changed our policy and been more flexible in this respect because of consumers like you that have asked, that if a company wants it to say DE, and we know that, that in fact it's only dairy equipment, we will now list it as, as DE. But otherwise, it's going to be OUD um, because, first of all, it, it's, an, it's another level that we have to affirm that there's no dairy ingredient and not ju that's only not, not just an issue of Kalim, and that the equipment's all clean and so on. And that's another level that we don't necessarily, you know, for, for, this, for this incremental value about not by not getting involved. But because, but soy milk and things like that, that necessary for children, we're, we've been moving already over the last few years, designating it either as DE or saying dairy equipment. Okay, well, uh, let, let's, let's Again, when the company when the company is asking us, we are now beginning to list it as DE. No, but, but no, just to, just to follow up on the chocolate, um, I know it was a, it wasn't actually the question was Rabbi Ganak was just responding to the OU's position on DE, and the question was what about chocolate chips? Are they just DE or are they really par or are they really dairy? Um, it wasn't actually an OU product; it was a OK product. Trader Joe chocolate chips, but anyone who's familiar, I don't think time allows us to go into the details, but if you walk into a chocolate factory, the ingredient that chocolate is allergic to is water. You know, you'll ever, if you'll ever notice in the summer, your chocolate gets sort of discolored. The reason it gets discolored, the reason it gets discolored is because it comes in contact with humidity, with moisture, and therefore chocolate factories are very, very reluctant 
to allow any real kashring to take place in their factory. So even bittersweet chocolate or the chocolate chips are really dairy because those, that equipment wasn't kashered. That's not the E. You know, it's hard to answer a question like that because, you know, it's not something you heard from Rabbi Ganak or me. So it's hard for us to defend what somebody else who probably doesn't know what they're talking about said. But, uh, but, but, but the question is a fair question, and I want to answer it on two levels. First of all, what I didn't say also when I spoke about the OU in Israel, not only is the OU in Israel, in our opinion, a great hashgacha, if anything, the OU in Israel has standards, higher standards, that we don't have here in the United States. I'll give you two examples. Rabbi Ganak gave the presentation about Chol Stam, that we're not marked, but certainly everybody knows, on Chol Yisrael in the United States. In Israel, we're marked on Chol Yisrael. There, is one, there are one or two exceptions where it's very clearly noted. Another example is Yoshon. The OU outside of Israel is not mocked, is not careful that all the baked products or any product that comes with an ingredient from the grains is yoshon. In Israel, we are mocked that everything should be yoshon. So certainly, we feel that our supervision in Israel is of a very high standard. So, but let's talk. No, 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 no. It's okay. It's it's okay. Um, we we don't get offended that quickly. If we did, we couldn't be in this business. Um, but I, but what I do want to say. But what I do want to say is, you know, Israel, first of all, the OU has had some difficulty in getting proper staffing in Israel, which has been, and we used to have uh, Rabbi Avram Rubin from Rehovot, who was very well known, but then he went off and made his own Ashgacha, so people thought that represented a change, but it didn't. And the other thing is, unlike the United States, when someone goes to the store in the United States to buy a product, I recognize that not everybody buys from every hashgacha. But that's because you feel that this hashgacha is reliable, this hashgacha is not reliable. You know, when you go to Israel shopping, it's like you're going to an election. <laughs> and and I, I, I use this supervision because I'm affiliated with this political party. I'm, I'm a chassid, I'm a misnagid, I'm a sfardi. So it's, it's a much more political environment. In general, Israel is much more political than the United States. And the OU maybe doesn't fit in great into that political scheme. I just, I, I just, but your observation, when you say, we hear this all the time. Is the OU in Israel the same as the OU in America? The, but you know, now we can have it in one word, yes. The answer, the answer, the answer is no. Uh, is the OU looking to become more chalvi sol? The answer is no. I mean, we, well, if there's products that are chalvi sol and they interested, but you see, I just want to explain something about what the OU did, because it was actually a revolution in America, precedes any other people in this room. But I remember when I was growing up, not such ancient history, but you know, in the 1950s, it was not so much. There weren't so many products that you could easily buy. So what did we do? We used to look at the at the wrapper, and if it didn't say chaz fishlach on it, we knew it was okay. But what the OU did was make for the average American Jew, right? Not the not the person in Borough Park, but for the average Jew in America, able to keep kosher at the same price essentially that everything else he he, he buys is. Because how this happened, we, but major companies throughout the United States, Procter and Gamble and Nestle's and and so on and so forth, bought, um, m uh, produce brought it to the OU as a symbol for their marketing reasons, because they both as service to our community, but also because they thought there was a niche market that they were interested, which was this niche market that goes beyond the kosher market. Th that's the Jew we were interested in serving, to make sure that it, and, and by the way, the guy in Borough Park, everything that he eats, almost everything, is posited on the OU system. All the basic ingredients, wh wh whether it be you know, oils or, or emulsifiers or or uh, flavors, all of them started under, under the OU. And that's why they coordinate all their activities with the OU. And the real expertise, 
that exists in the United States for this whole framework, it started at the OU. I just want to add to what Rabbi Ganak said. I know we have very little time left. The last time the Belzer Rebbe was here in the United States, the last time the Belzer Rebbe was here in the United States, he asked us, Rabbi Ganak and myself, to come see him. And we came to see him, and he says, you know, he's heard all about the OU, and he's heard how positive the OU is and the B'nai Torah at the OU, and he said the same thing you said. He said, you know, maybe it's time for the OU to now become Makbut only on Chol Yisrael. And Rabbi Ganak answered him, I was sitting right next to him, and Rabbi Ganak answered him and he said, the OU was not just built for the Jews in Brooklyn. The OU was also built for the Jew in Texas. And the Jew in Texas, won't, they won't send Chol Yisrael milk because they won't send two cases of milk to Dallas. And he also <coughs> deserves to eat kosher.